Oh, how love I thy law. Psalm 119, 97. So the Christian loves the moral law which condemns him. See, when he's converted, it's, oh, how hate I thy law, because he, of course, had thought it would save him. But once he realized that so far from it being a meritorious foundation for his salvation, it actually is a basis for his damnation because he, of course, doesn't keep it as it requires uh, the person who hopes to be saved by it to keep it. Now, Jesus, remember, Jesus was saved by the keeping of the law. It's because he kept the law that we're saved by the keeping of the law, by his keeping of the law, and the merit which he achieved by the keeping of the law transferred to us. We achieve nothing but condemnation by our efforts at law keeping, but he perfectly met all that God was required and was justified by the law and gave graciously to us the justification which he achieved by the law. But the idea of any merit in it from us by our law keeping is, of course, out of the question. As a matter of fact, it condemns us all the time, as I was mentioning in that previous lecture. We break it every time we open our mouths, every time we breathe a thought or have an idea or do an act. We fall short of perfection, and the law requires perfection. So in a certain sense, it's constantly humiliating to us. And yet here's the psalmist, just one of verses, that this 119th Psalm abounds with this type of thing. Oh, how love I thy law. Number two, because the moral law constantly condemning him, the Christian, is what constantly drives him to Jesus who saves him. See, that's the reason he loves the law, even though the law condemns. The law, the law condemns the Christian. And the condemnation brings him back to Christ. Drives him, let's see, drives him to Christ constantly. It isn't because of this that the psalmist can sing, Oh, how love I thy law. It's because of this. But these two in the Christian experience are inextricably combined. As we saw before, blessed is the one who mourns. He mourns because he's condemned. He's ashamed, and that's what brings him to a one called Jesus who would save his people from their sins. So it sounds strange on the surface of it. And there's some Christians, uh, avowed Christians at least, who can't live with the idea. I, I, they think they'd choke on 119th Psalm, Oh, how love I thy law. And you can understand why they would have problems with it because of the fact that they don't keep it perfectly. And it accuses them constantly and condemns them before the judgment seat of Christ and so on. But when you remember, that's exactly what keeps them in constant dependence upon Christ. This is a divine device, trick if I may call it, a heavenly trick by means of which God, making us trip and fall on our faces, brings us constantly into sweet and loving and profoundly grateful communion with our Lord and Savior. There's no possibility of our ever feeling independent of Christ because the law keeps us constantly in remembrance of our sin and our everlasting need of Jesus Christ our Lord. Number three, the kiss of death brings life. Romans 9, uh, 7. Let's look at that passage a little bit more uh, closely. Here, the apostle, you remember, is being autobiographical. This is the most important Christian life that was ever lived. It's the model for all of us who are followers of the Lamb, to follow in the footsteps of the Apostle Paul. So this description of the Apostle's conversion, which is spread through these uh, chapters in Romans, is a model for the conversion of all of us. And uh, while we don't have to be an ex-rabbi, uh, or one of the greatest geniuses of all times, as Paul was, we do, however, 
uh, have to undergo the same kind of experience. And in Romans 9, 7, Paul is showing it in relation to the law. He says, I was alive once apart from the law. The commandment came, commandment came, sin revived, I died. Now what does the apostle mean by that? As I say, he's being autobiographical. He says, I was alive once. He was very much alive when he wrote these words. This sounds as if he were no longer alive, of course, but he's very much alive when he uses the language, I was alive once, but it's once apart from the law. Now that's a very strange statement coming from a, a rabbi who sat at Gamaliel's feet. And according to his reputation, even in Judaism, he would have been an outstanding rabbi. And anybody who knows anything about the Apostle Paul realizes that converted or unconverted, this was one of the greatest minds of all time. Someone has said that the, just the book of Romans alone would establish that fact. No human being could write a book like that if he didn't have uh, a magnitude of intellectual genius uh, without any uh, doubt at all. But here he was a rabbinic scholar. I once time was on the Mediterranean with a, in a steamer with uh, hundreds of Jews who were coming from the Leipzig, Germany area to take up residence uh, and citizenship in the newly formed state of uh, Israel. And the, uh, uh, I remember one of the persons on board that ship was a rabbinic scholar who had a Bible about twice the size of this one, and in the center of it was the Hebrew text of the Old Testament, and then all around in very tiny script were the comments on that particular text by the rabbis of the ages. I hardly ever saw that young man a rabbinic scholar without his head in that particular book. I couldn't even engage him in conversation as I would like to have done. He was just too busy with his own uh, studies to take time to talk with uh, anybody, apparently, at least not uh, with me. I got quite well acquainted with a number of persons on shipboard in that 10 days we were on the Mediterranean, but not with this uh, young man. Well, it's the kind of person Paul must have been before his conversion, just pouring over the text of the Old Testament and familiar with the teaching of the rabbis of the ages and so on. Uh, a man to say, I was alive apart from the law once when he was immersed in the law all the time makes you wonder, but you realize what he means is, I was apart from any real understanding of the law. Oh, I read it. I knew about it. I was putting Christians to death because I conceived of them as breakers of the law. But what he meant by apart from the law was apart from any real understanding of the law. It always reminds me of a, book, a novel which Booth Tarkington wrote. It was illustrating the mysteriousness of uh, women, mis uh, feminine nature. But what led him to write the book was not a woman at all, but it was his uh, grandfather Tarkington. And uh, what stirred uh, his interest in grandfather Tarkington was that he was such an open book. Everybody in the Talkington family knew everything there was to know about Grandfather Talkington. There was nothing subtle, no hidden corners, no hidden agenda in Grandfather Talkington until Booth discovered one day he was an absolute and total mystery to one member of the family, and that member turned out to be Grandmother, that Talkington realized that Booth Talkington's grandfather was not nearly as easily understood as he fancied. Now, that's the way it was with the Apostle Paul. He knew all about the law. And one day he discovered he didn't know anything about it. He was studying it all the time, but not understanding its meaning at all. And then the commandment came. You can see what that means. The commandment came home to him. This commandment I'm working with all the time, all of a sudden it dawned on me what this really meant. It registered, it clicked. You know the kind of slang we use. It came home is a piece of American slanguage which would really be an exegesis of the Greek word the apostle uses here. The commandment that he'd been studying about and writing about and preaching about and persecuting about and so on came home to him. Its real meaning clicked with him, sin revived. 
Now, sin was there all the time. We know that the apostle makes it as clear as anybody in the Bible that when we fell in Adam, sin, of course, was dominant in our natures. We were absolutely the bond servants of the flesh and so on. But what he means by revived is that it came into his consciousness. He was painfully aware of it. Previously, he'd been a legalist. He read the law. He mastered the law. He kept the law. He believed in precision and perfection, and he was, ex he was alive. He was confident. He was sure of himself. He despised these Christians who followers of the false Messiah because, among other things, they were attacking the way of salvation by the law. He was alive in the law. He knew it, and he kept it, and he despised a good many of his Jewish kinsmen because even though they were Jews, they didn't know the law. He was a Jew who knew the law. He was an Israelite among the Israelites, and so on. And he uh, was proud of that. But when the commandment came home in its real meaning, he was conscious of the fact that so far from being an acceptable law keeper who was going to make heaven on the basis of his legal efforts and was pleasing to God because he was so successful in it, he realized he was a goner. He was a sinner. He was under the judgment of God. He hadn't even understood what the law meant, and he hadn't kept the solitary iota of it. Sin revived. He no longer was alive now. He died. He was very much alive who wrote the words, I died, but I died to my former self. I died to the legalist in, in the bosom of Saul of Tarsus. I became Paul because I was dead to all of this now, and I was becoming alive to a world of real spirituality and true life. But I'm saying in number three there that the kiss of death brings life. This is the way the law actually leads by death to uh, life. Now, this does not show how he comes to life. This just shows what the law can do, namely kill you. But once you're conscious of being dead, then at least you look for real life. And Paul describes his uh, searching and his odyssey in the rest of the chapter 7, from which this is the ninth uh, a verse, as you know. Number four, the moral law is Christ's lasso, which keeps us from wandering from the God we love. Number five, the remaining sinner in the Christian hates the moral law, which nevertheless condemning him keeps bringing him to the Savior. The saint in the Christian loves the moral law because it's the expression of the beloved Lord who saves him. I spelled this all out in considerable detail and use of the blackboard and so on. Here I'm just summarizing it. This is the purpose of these handouts. It gives you in the concrete what the teacher is trying to communicate, and you may jot down all over it whatever you please as I go along there, and hopefully you'll remember some of the development which I gave, but whether you do or not, at least you'll have the uh, essence uh, from which I did uh, develop these various and sundry lectures. Number six, one cannot love Christ without loving Christ's law. That is, loving the very nature or character or excellency of Christ. Remember, that's what the law is. The law of God, the law of Christ, is an expression of the moral nature of the deity. And if you're going to sing, my Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine, you're going to sing, oh, how love I thy law. You see, that's uh, the part of it. If you hate the law, you hate Jesus Christ who's the embodiment of the law. And because of his perfection, exposes you as a sinner in need of his keeping of the law given graciously to you. Let me uh, remind you of that again, because that is not uh, mentioned too often, even in uh, Reformed handbooks of uh, theology. It's generally recognized and believed. It's just not mentioned as often, perhaps, as uh, I'm mentioning it, uh, it here. We are saved. by the law. You see, I could be dismissed from just about any evangelical ministry for saying something like that if you didn't understand what I mean by that. We are saved by the law. That is Christ's keeping of the law perfectly. And giving us his merit by grace. We're saved by grace, meaning by that 
It's the grace which gives us the benefit of his law keeping so that in a certain sense, we are saved by the law and nobody ever was saved by any other means than the law. The Hindus are right. The law of karma is ultimate. It'll be the test of everybody, but it condemns everybody. The only one who's ever filled the law, fulfilled the law of Moses or the law of karma is Jesus Christ. And no one else can fulfill it. No one else has fulfilled it except vicariously. When you accept the grace he offers, what you accept is the benefit of his having kept the law uh, for you. As I say, when you put it this way, you for, you'll never forget how absolutely indispensable the law is. And coming from an evangelical preacher and a, a, the, the Savior himself and so on, you realize this must be understood as the way of salvation graciously bestowed to you. And while we rejoice in grace, and it's impossible to exaggerate grace, we ought to remember that that grace is the giving us the merit achieved by the keeping of the law on the part of our a savior. I, I see my time is up, so I'll have to run into the uh, next hour for the completion of this lecture.